the day-to-day living, they were irritated enough, and there was enough confusion and anger, they just said enough with it. And of course, of course the last point of this slide is that, Diane, do me a favor, can you, if you're not asking a question, please put it on mute, because I, I do hear background noise. Culture takes time to evolve. It's not an overnight thing. I was talking about this in my ethics class. Just look at cultural values, the way that women dress, the way that men dress, the types of, the things that we consider to be entertainment. All right? Um, you, t- you talk to your great-grandparents and try to explain to them the concept of going away for, for the Jewish holidays to a hotel. You know what they're going to say? What's wrong with the food in bed at your house? You have to spend $10,000 to go away? So the food at home is not good enough? Your pillow is not comfortable? Your bed's not comfortable? They don't understand it because in their cultures, money may have been very scarce, and nobody, unless you were uber, uber rich, would even consider doing something like that. Um, Just look at our culture with smartphones without getting too preachy over here. You take somebody from 50 years ago, put them in a time machine and transport them here, and everyone's like texting, and everybody has these white things coming out of the ears. They're like, whoa. Did, did, what happened? Did, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the visual. Uh, <laughs> is it real? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It's real. AliExpress. AliExpress. No. Don't laugh. Today I saw a knockoff in one of the. It was a. It was a Walgreens. I saw a knockoff with those earbuds. Like six minutes. <laughs> yes. My sister bought one. Doesn't work. Yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't play games. Either you buy real or go home. Anyway, let's move on. Any questions thus far? I'm either doing a great job explaining. I'm just too tired to ask questions. Great I would, job pref- I would prefer. We're gonna go the former. I- we're gonna go. Great job explaining. Mm-hmm. So that's that's what I'm hoping. Okay, great. Let's move on. Creating organizational culture, types of cultures, customer service. Definitely look at Zappos as an example. Um, I think I showed Zappos in business policy. Yeah. They have a quirky, crazy, blue hair tie dye kind of kind of culture. But if you get on the phone and you need something, they will go to the ends of the earth to make you happy because that is the culture. Amazon, although they've taken the heat for having poor corporate culture, people crying at their desks, uh, pregnant women being made to stand on their feet for hours, go read the New York Times and things like that. However, and again, I'm not for or against Amazon right now. It's not not my own view. They have really good customer service. Their customer service is insane. Is off the charts. Off the charts insane. I remember myself, I had bought two pairs of headphones, expensive ones, and one of them wasn't working well. I honestly think, looking back, it's like, I don't think I really know how to operate them. No questions. Return one, keep the other for your inconvenience. And we're talking about a $150 pair of headphones. They were monsters. I just Monster ordered, headphones. I yeah. made a huge order of like school books and other things, and I ordered it by mistake to my house, to my house back home. And then I also, and I did it on the a wrong credit card. And I was like... So I called them and I told them like, listen, I, it was like suggested. I didn't even see like, because usually it's like my whatever. And so they refunded me and right away. And they're like, okay, they'll, it was sent to the wrong address. I thought like maybe we could work something out or like I just there was, like there was nothing to work out. It's no, like, no problem. I was, I was so I was like, wow. It, it's true. Yeah. It's true. And that's one of their saving graces. Again, I'm not going to get into the whole discussion on Amazon. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll talk about them in a different course. But um, definitely not, you know, their, their customer service. No one is going to go on record as saying that Amazon's customer service is subpar because it's not. Uh, ethical behaviors or the lack thereof. I mean, just look at Sarbanes Oxley. It, it came about because of Enron, WorldCom. I mean, if Enron didn't happen, you wouldn't have all these safety measures. Diversity, whether or not a company is diverse or not. I'm, I'm very proud of my company. I work in a company where diversity is not just preached, but it's practiced. You walk in there, you see representation of the local neighborhood in every which way. There's no issue of, are there enough women? The only, the only thing is, is that, no, there's just too, maybe there are too many women, not enough men. Like, if you really wanted to look at the numbers, which is silly. I mean, don't, well, it's the opposite. Healthcare, though, is like, um, um, more women go into it, though, but in certain fields, like, in healthcare, than men. It's ridiculously, in, it, there's 80, 85% women, 15% men. It's more than even the norm. We're so into diversity, we're, we're like super. I don't think we do it, I, honestly, I don't think we do it consciously. I think it's just that my boss is colorblind and I'm colorblind and I don't care about these kinds of things. I care about one thing and one thing only. Are you compassionate? Are you competent? And do you know how to laugh? 
and you're a nice person, can you hand and can you handle pressure? Those are the things that I ask. I could care less where you come from, what language you speak. I don't care what your belief system is. As long as you're respectful and you're not hurtful in any way, I'm 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 okay with you working there. Anyway, benefits of a positive culture. Let's talk about that. Increased teamwork. Of course, if you have increased teamwork, everything goes easier. There's there's less sick calls. Just think about it. What what did not the, okay. I'm going to make a statement. You don't have to tell me if you agree, if you actually did this or that. Not everybody that calls in sick is really sick. Can, can we agree on that? Yeah. Would you say possible that people call in sick because they just are so sick of their workplace, they just need a break for the day? Mental health day. Mental, a mental health day. Now, why are you taking a mental health day? Because the place where you work is taking a toll on your mental health. You don't feel, you, you feel like it's sucking the life out of you. Now, if your workplace is sucking the life out of you, that's probably because it's not a place where there's safety. Remember I told, spoke about circle of safety with Simon Sinek? There's a lack of teamwork. You're busy expending all your energy on, prevent, on checking to see if the guy or the gal behind you is trying to stab you in the back and trying to mess you up in business. So if there's increased teamwork, I would posit to say there'll probably be less sick calls. Also, physically people will feel better because when you're nervous, you have cortisol running through your body, which is not a normal thing. Cortisol is only supposed to be running through your body if you're being chased by a rhinoceros or, God forbid, a mugger is chasing a person or they're in a dangerous situation and the adrenaline button has to be, you know, turbocharged. Yeah, then you turbocharge. But if you're constantly in turbocharge mode, your body is affected. Information sharing, which is important. People want to, and, and that's really an out, uh, that's an outcome, if you will, or it orbits teamwork. If you want to look at teamwork as the earth and you want to look at information sharing as the moon, that would be a valid comparison. And better, better employee morale, and that's very, very important. I mean, just think of this. Imagine you had an employee that was toxic, that, was, that left on their own, and was like, yay, ding dong, the witch is dead, right? As they said in the Wizard of Oz. And then the boss brings them back a year later. What's the message? I don't care about your feelings. I don't care about how you feel. Uh, we kind of could use her, him or her back. So I don't care if she or he or she is toxic. Get over it. You know, grow, grow tough skin. You know, ignore them. And I've heard these things. Ah, just throw them out of your office if they get uh, abrasive. Eh, don't pay attention to them. No, it's very important. Right? Nobody would accept a workplace that would have rats running around or bed bugs or, or leaks and spiders, right? Everybody will crazy. I'm not working You'd here. You'd be surprised. No, but nobody would accept it on a long-term basis. You have rats running around your desk, right? And if you do accept that, I feel bad for you. That means you're in a really bad situation. Why would you expect a to- Why would you accept a toxic culture? Why would you accept a culture where yelling is okay and screaming is okay? I remember I once took a job somewhere, and the person who interviewed me, the boss, seemed like a pretty reasonable straight shooter. Within five minutes, it was a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde transformation. He was yelling at me in five minutes, and I'm like... I don't understand. What could I have done wrong that you're yelling at me? I don't even have a computer log on yet. I don't even know what your expectations are of me yet. What did I do wrong? And you know what his answer was? That's the way we do things here. We yell and scream. Get used to it. Don't take it, per- don't take it to heart. And I'm like, wow, welcome to Alcatraz. Have fun. Have fun. I guess, I have to, I guess my, 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 shirt will be, my shirt and pants will be orange. What's my number on my lapel? Okay, I mean, it's crazy, Un- unacceptable. And I've worked in places like that. I once consulted in an organization where the boss was a chain smoker. He would blow smoke in your face. I remember him hiring me, and he's giving me this speech about you have to be serious and don't be joking, and, and you have to be professional. And meanwhile, he's blowing, like, tons of smoke. Like, I'm, I'm like, oh, my gosh, I need, I need oxygen. And, like, he was a walking, talking contradiction. I remember... Instead of using the intercom to page people, he would scream people's names outside of his de- office. He wouldn't get off his lazy body and get up and, and say, hey, can you please come in? Or even get out and yell people's names. I remember him in boardroom meetings and we would deride employees, make fun of employees, embarrass them. It's funny, he, he offered me, after my consulting stint was over, he liked my work, he offered me a job. I'm like, Mm-mm. I'd rather work in Burger King and flip burgers for, for, for minimum wage than work here. No way. No way. No way. And I love these people. Like, why don't people want to stay in the organization? It's like they don't get it. It's like somebody, it just, 
Imagine somebody, I, I know this is a little bit of a harsh thing, imagine somebody who's been homeless and on the street for, for, for a while and they, they don't smell too well. Eventually, they don't even realize they don't smell good. And they wonder, why is everyone like, you know, running away from me? You get so used to it, you don't even realize you're doing something wrong. When you do the same thing over and over again and you reinforce that bad behavior, after a while, you become oblivious, you totally don't pay attention. Now, themes that appear, that appear in research. Cultures are elusive and hidden, so they are hard to diagnose, manage, and change. Sometimes they can be kind of like an undercurrent, and all of a sudden they, they explode. Deliberate attempts to change culture are not really practical. You know, it's like taking on, it's like you're not going to have a, 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 an arm wrestle with a grizzly bear. It's just not going to turn out well for you. That's pretty much what you're doing when you take on a culture. Uh, culture sustain people through periods of difficulty and ward off anxiety. That's a positive thing because when everyone everyone is committed to the same cause and everyone's in the same danger, everybody pulls together. It helps. Like I remember in the wake of 9/11, New Yorkers um, took off their tough exterior and they really, really showed what they're all about. Everyone was helping each other. Also, like after Hurricane Sandy, the amount of compassion it was just beautiful to see that that human beings really step up to the plate when necessary. People naturally resist change to, new, to a new culture. So you have to understand that. So when you're trying to affect change in, in an organization, many people, I mean, by, ra- by a show of hands, how many people love change over here? I didn't think so. Most people don't like change. As much as you hate boredom, you do like predictability. I know it sounds like a contradiction, but everybody likes to know... Boredom and predictability are different things. Well, if things are predictable, they could become boring. If you have a, if you have a, the same I mean, schedule, right. it could get boring... But at the same time, there's a certain level of comfort yeah. that you know. Sometimes, I don't know, you go to a restaurant with a friend. Hey, let's try this new dish. Uh, I, I, I know I like The last three I times like this. I did that, I regretted it. So. Again, and, and, and you know what? And then, then that, that, that'll lead to possibly you not tasting something delicious because you're afraid. Because yeah. you have those three times. Because remember, as human beings, I was having this discussion with someone. I'll give you a true example of this. And you may say, Professor, is this a therapy session? But it's not. I really want to explain this to you because I, I've been around the block a little bit longer than most of you, all of you have been. I remember my first job, without getting into where we went, it was a terrible job. My two bosses were absolutely out of their mind. They should have been institutionalized. Literally, they were cra- stir crazy. And every time they paged me, I remember back in the day they had beepers, it, came, it was a terrible interaction. It was, always a, it was always a beat down or a scream down. Thank God, eventually I found, I mean, eventually, very shortly I found a better job, treated much better, and, and I don't, I have never, and I hope will never, and I don't wish this on anyone, ever have a, a work environment like that. But to this day, when my boss calls me, even if the dean calls me, I get a lump in my throat. Why am I getting a lump in my throat? Because... I'm still, part of that old toxic culture is still in my body. There's that little cell that's left over. And it's hard, it's that, vis, it's that vestige. It's a vestigial experience that's very, very hard. I mean, it's a trauma. I mean, in a way, it's not, I wouldn't say it's post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not like you're out in the open and you're in Afghanistan and your friend gets killed. It's not that crazy. But you understand how trauma works. You have a traumatic experience so that traumatic experience will leave its effect on you, and things can happen to you later on in life that trigger that trauma all over again. Maybe not as badly, but it's vestigial, it's still there. So that comes from culture as well. Whereas if you're in a culture and one treats you well, so when your boss calls you, you're like, oh yeah, what's the big deal? He's probably asking me to take care of something, which is my job. So really, you know, a culture could, could, could build you or break you, and, and, and it could leave everlasting effect on you that will never change. I don't think I'll ever have that feeling changed. I know, and I, and I, and I, it's funny, like today my boss calls me and I'm like, oh gosh, what's wrong? What's he going to say? Nothing. He gave me a to-do list. That's my job. Your boss calls you in the office to give you a to-do list. That's what you're supposed to do. But because of that thing that I had 25 years ago and I had those two crazy bosses and how they treated me, every single time I call into the office, I automatically assume it's going to be something negative. And that's terrible. But that really is, shows you how much a toxic culture can affect a human being. And could you imagine if you work in a culture like that for 25 years? Imagine if I never left. I could honestly say if I never left, I probably would be unemployable. 
only be able to work in that kind of deranged kind of culture. I'd never be able to work in a normal country, culture. Just think of you know that story of that that child that was you know kidnapped by wolves, so to speak, and grew up in the forest. He never learned how to eat with forks and knives because that he lived in the forest. He ate, you know he ate rodents. Somebody who grows up like that can't just change overnight. Any comments, questions? I know I just used to work in a place like that. Any time I, I saw him message from my boss, I had a voicemail. My heart was like, zero. Why? Because they would yell at you. Sometimes, sometimes he's a very nice person. He's just very uptight. And like, if you walk in the door at nine oh two, you get a whole voice note saying it's unacceptable, or whatever. So. And, and you could tell there are certain but, people that you that when, when you engage in conversation, you could tell they're wound up. Yeah. Like they literally look like they're like they look like a pin that was pulled out of a grenade just waiting to explode. For no reason, they come in. They have this what I call a screw face. Like, like they look like they're all like tense. I'm like, what happened? My gosh! And there are people like that, and I'm, I'm I feel bad for their their husbands and their wives and their children and for them because that's not a way to live. And when you when you're like that, it's not only you that becomes damaged, but you damage everyone else around you. It's like somebody with the flu that comes to work. You're getting everybody sick. If you're if you're a negative person, you as a boss, you're destroyed. And people don't realize how much productivity is lost because of this. I once worked for a place where the the boss was lazy. There's nothing as bad as working for a lazy boss. I was like, wow, he's wealthy despite the fact he was meant meant to be wealthy. And when he didn't come into work, I was so happy because I could actually be productive because he would give me these ridiculous assignments to save a few dollars where I could have been going out and getting clients and, and making serious pl- money for the place. And then he complained like, oh yeah, you know, you're not doing enough for the organization. I'm like, yeah, because you have me going on these stupid errands for you, personal things, instead of me doing my job, which is what you hired me to do. Uh, even him, I'd say, come, let's go see a client. No, 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 no. I want to save money on office supplies. So you save 20 bucks, we could have made 20,000 bucks. Like, what's wrong with you? But again, it's a cultural thing. And it's cultural my own. You know, you, you become culture, cultural tunnel vision. And you just don't see anything outside of the way that you're inculcated. And God forbid if somebody gives you another opinion or tries to teach you something different, oh, oh all of a sudden you're questioning my way of thinking? No. You just instead of eating cereal milk for breakfast every day, I want you to try toast and eggs. That's all it is. And people view that as a threat. If you suggest... How many of you... Has anybody ever worked in an organization where if you make a suggestion, you have to be afraid... I, in that first culture that I, the organization I spoke about, it was toxic. We had a meeting. I made a suggestion, and instead of saying, and it happened to be an excellent suggestion, not because I said just people like, oh, that's a great, great suggestion. My boss said instead of saying, oh, thank you, that's a great thing. You know, you know what she said? That's the first smart thing you ever said. Yeah. Guess what? Now, I don't mean to be vindictive. When I left the organization. I gave them one week notice, and I was so disgusted with them, I used to come into work whenever I wanted it for that last week. And when I would get paged overhead, I would ignore the pages. I would not do my work. I would just sit around like this because I felt there was no need for me to do anything past because, I, A, I was hurt as an individual. I felt like as a culture, you never, ever appreciate anything that I did, so why should I do anything? You think I'm incompetent? Okay, I will now... Act as I will now live your. I will now uh, uh, fulfill your prophecy for you, and that's very bad, because when you and when you do that, can you imagine how much turnover you have in the organization? When you have turnover, you have turmoil. To constantly training people, the recruitment costs go up. Right? I don't have time to do my job because I'm training you to do your job, and then you leave after six months to a year. Then I got to do that all over again. It becomes a vicious cycle, and that is that is indicative of a decrepit corporate culture. Exhibit th- two, two, three, Zappos, 10 core values. Uh, we were talking about Zappos before. Now, why are they so amazing? Well, look at their values. Deliver wow through service. Enha- embrace and drive change. Create fun and a li- little weirdness. Yeah, they're a little bit more than a little weird. They're super weird, but that's okay. That's fine. Be adventurous, creative, and open-minded. Pursue growth and learning. Build open and honest relationships. Build a positive team and family spirit. Do more with less. Be passionate and determined, and be humble. Now, what's the importance of humility? Because when you're humble, you're going to consider other people's opinions. 
you're going to realize that you don't have the answer to everything and you're not the smartest person in the room. But you will be. Why? Because you listen. Sustaining the culture, socialization. The process by which organizations bring new employees into the culture and they become indoctrinated or they become a part of that culture. A transmittal of values, assumptions, and attitudes. The goal is achieving person, sorry, the goal is achieving person, organization, fit. Transmission of values and socialization. Those, I know it looks like the target symbol, yeah. okay, but it doesn't have the white, it's not white in the middle. But that's very important. Person, organization, fit. That's what I was talking about before. It's not enough to know your job. You have to actually fit in. And if you don't fit in, it's not like, oh, what's the big deal? So they don't fit in, but they do their job well. It's a big deal. And why do bosses make that mistake? Because they don't work with that person on a day-to-day -day basis. I had this with one boss, and this, they had this employee, and she was absolutely insane. Like, honestly, like everybody wanted her out. And he was like, that's so strange. She's so nice to me. I'm like, because you're the boss. Of course she's going to be nice to you. She's not that stupid. She has this much emotional intelligence and, and brains. But again, unless you're dealing with that person on a day-to-day -day basis, listen to your employees. Right? You need to have a culture where if somebody's veering off the culture, you put your hand around the person and say, buddy, coming 10 minutes late every day is not cool because that puts unnecessary strain on everybody else. We don't do that here. We don't speak that way here. We don't, we, we, that's unacceptable here. You want to fit in and do well here, this is what you need to do. That's a strong culture where everybody feels that we're on the same page or everybody feels that this is super important to be like this. All right, um, let's move on to the next slide. One of those error slides, I don't know why they put those in. Socialization, the process model. Way to structure socialization, collective, be formal, it can be in sequences. You invest, serial, and fixed. Career stage model of socialization. I just want to go back and see if there's any comments on the bottom. Sometimes they have notes on the bottom. I see that here they do not have notes on the bottom. Okay, let's move here. And by the way, just, just go into the text, and there'll be definitely more expansive information here. I don't have the time in class to go through every single definition, but feel free the text is excellent, and the text is robust and has a lot, a lot of information. Career stage model of socialization. Socialization stages coincide with anticipatory socialization, accommodation, and role management throughout your stay in the organization, managing your role and how you interact with people. Let's look at these things. Anticipatory socialization, recruitment using realistic job previews. Okay. Selection and placement using realistic career paths. Provide detailed information about the organization, history, founders, milestones, success stories. Important. This makes you look like a real organization, a place where you want to work. Accommodation socialization, tailor-made and individualized orientation programs. Very important to make someone feel very, very safe and very, very much valued. Social, social as well as social skills trainings. Supportive and accurate feedback. Challenging work assignments, demanding but fair supervisors. Nothing wrong with being demanding as long as you're fair at the same time. Role management socialization, provision of professional counseling, adaptive and flexible work assignments. That's a part of role management. Mentoring. Right? There's the mentor and the protege. Mentor is the one giving advice. Right? The teacher and the protege is the student. So mentor is a friend, coach, advisor, or sponsor who supports, encourages, and helps a less experienced protege. Fancy French word, it is not on a French menu. Mentoring function, career functions, sponsoring someone, exposure, visibility, coaching, production, challenging assignments, psychological functions, role modeling. It's important, if you're a mentor, you have to be a good example. Acceptance, confirmation, counseling, friendship. You want to be friends to an extent with your mentor. You want to feel comfortable. You, want to take, you should take that person out to coffee. You know, and if you, there's a budget, take them out to dinner. Tell them how things are done. Tell them that I want to invest in you. I want to make you feel like you're going to grow. Somebody like that will not leave the organization so quickly. If you have someone that takes an active interest in you, why would you want to leave so quickly? You wouldn't. You, want to, you feel comfortable with such a person. 
feel like, wow, he really cares about, you know, he cares about me. Um, like in leadership, you talk about in the military, the, 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 the top brass that truly cares about their soldiers will get everything out of those soldiers. When you're callous with your soldiers and you show that you don't care about their lives and their safety, are they going to go out of their way to do the mission? Absolutely not. It's basic human nature that we have to understand here. Um, 2.6, phases of mentoring relationship. So there's, I'm going to just move up a little bit over here because I'm not as young as I used to be. So I feel like a blogger moving around over here. All right, so we have phases. You're looking at, this, at the slide. Yeah, I just want people to see the slide here. This is what I'm reading off of. Phases, initiation, cultivation, separation, and redefinition. So initiation, the definition is a period of six months to a year during which time the relationship gets started and begins to have importance for both managers. Turning points, fantasies of where you think you're supposed to be become, uh, become concrete expectations, expectations are met, senior managers provides coaching, challenging work, etc., Cultivation, a period of two to five years uh, in which time the range of career and psychological functions provided expands to a maximum. Opportunities for meaningful and more frequent interaction increase. And of course, you feel very, very much in with the boss, so to speak, and you feel like you've gotten somewhere. Like I remember where I currently work, when I first started working there, I was a little bit intimidated by my boss. And for the first six months to a year, I kind of felt somewhat comfortable but not too comfortable. After being there for almost eight years, I have a totally different relationship now because of that cultivation. Separation, a period of six months to two years after a significant change in the structural role relationship and or the emotional experience of the relationship. For example, junior manager no longer wants guidance, but rather the opportunity to work more autonomously. Senior manager faces midlife crisis and is less available to provide mentoring functions. Somebody gets sick, God forbid. There's some sort of other crisis that a person has in their personal life, now they don't have the wherewithal to help. Redefinition, an indefinite period after the separation phase, during which time the relationship is ended or takes on significantly different characteristics, making it more peer-like friendship. For example, uh, stresses of separation diminish and new relationships are formed. The mentor relationship is no longer needed in its previous form because you got what you need. Uh, resentment and anger diminish, gratitude and appreciation increase, peer status is achieved, and you kind of get to where you're supposed to be going. And that's pretty much, you know, the mother bird kicking the chicks out of the nest. I hate to sound corny, but that's pretty much where you end up. All right, let's move on. Okay, clicker. Ways to be a great mentor. Determine the most valuable technique. Don't be afraid to be honest. Many times they're so afraid to Tell someone honestly what you know that they're doing something wrong because we don't want to hurt their feelings. Now you have to know how to criticize, right? There's a big difference between constructive and destructive criticism. You always want to make sure that the person understands you have their best interest at mind in mind. Get a mentor yourself. You know, even a barber has a barber, right? A dentist has a dentist. Uh, get mentees to agree with your style of of, of intervention. Don't keep your feelings bottled up. Very important at work not, and in life in general. Don't, I know I, you have to have a filter. You can't just say what's the first thing that comes to your mind, but you also have to have the ability to be able to express yourself in a relationship. I'm not trying to sound like a marriage counselor here, but it's super important that you need to feel comfortable with the people that you work with and you can tell them what's on your mind. Don't keep, um, understand that mentoring is an important relationship for both, both of you. Work at building trust and feeling, uh, and at it, and at feeling it yourself. It goes both ways. Realize that this process will change both of you for the better. Hopefully, spirituality and culture. Employees have a personal inner life. It nourishes and is nourished by performing relevant, meaningful, and challenging work. That is spirituality itself. If you feel like you're you're, you're producing, human beings naturally want to do things and produce things. What happens when a person retires and all of a sudden they just remove themselves from society, stay at home all day? They have all the money in the world. You know what happens? They die. Why do they die younger? Because they feel like they have no sense of purpose. That's why when a person retires and they volunteer or they work part-time and they do something to keep themselves busy, they feel that there's something worth living for. Spirituality is not the same as religion. Um, spirituality, I, I don't know if I agree with that. Uh, I think that religion can give you spirituality if you're doing it right. 
spirituality a personal private path that contains religious elements and points to a, pers a person's self-inquiry. Okay? Religion, a system of thought, set of doctrines and beliefs, prescribed code of conduct, product of, of a time or a place. Again, I don't feel really comfortable getting into theological discussion. I totally disagree with this statement. Um, it kind of takes all the spirit out of religion, and I just don't want to get into theological discussion, so I'm just going to leave it at that. The person and spirituality. Spirituality has, has not been given much research attention, considered soft or non-strategic, which is wrong. There's a long tradition in the U.S. of separating religion and government. It is logical to keep religion separate from non-government organizations as well. That stems from the fact that in Europe, the government was run by religious institutions and persecutions existed as a result of those religious uh, bodies. And, you know, just look at the, the, uh, the pilgrims that came to America. Why did they come here? Because they were, their religious beliefs caused them to be persecuted. Right? The Mennonites, you know, the people in Amish town, they left their countries of origin because they felt persecuted. And that's why the founding fathers were so into separation of religion and state. The problem is in today's day and age, They've gone so far where I feel that religion is persecuted sometimes at work. And that's not good either. Any form of persecution. It has to be a fine balance. And I think life is all about balance. Spirituality, work dimensions, research. Spirituality encourages trust, work-life balance, empathy and compassion for others, the value of human assets, development and self-actualization of people, meaning being all that you can be, ethical behavior, and better results. In review, did we give examples of how national culture and values influence workplace behavior? Absolutely, we did. We spoke about Hofstede. Describe the key components and layers of organizational culture? Absolutely. Explain the various methods that managers use to influence cultural change and identify ways in which socialization sustains organizational culture and compare the characteristics of effect of socialization. I thank you very much for joining tonight. Does anybody have any questions, comments, or concerns? Okay, and then I'm signing off. It's a wrap, folks. It's a wrap.